Shalom, I'm Chris. Let's follow Jesus along the Talmudim way. Acts chapter 24, we're continuing Paul in Caesarea. We're going to have his third defense before Governor Felix. Father, please bless our study today. Have us be Bereans who receive the word with all eagerness, but who examine the scriptures daily to see whether these things be so. By this teaching, enable each of us to be doers of your word and not merely hearers only. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Acts 24, verse 1. Now, after five days, the high priest Ananias came down with some elders and an attorney named Tertullus, and they brought charges against Paul to the governor. Ben Witherington, uh, who is a commentator, says, uh, quote, Acts 24 is presented to us as an oratorical duel between two accomplished rhetoricians, Tertullius and Paul offering us samplings of forensic rhetoric. A statement like that just makes my geek a meter antenna go way up. Um, I've worked directly for and around attorneys for most of the last 20 years, and, and maybe there's a part of me that always wanted to be a lawyer. So I, perhaps I'm living vicariously through all of these arguments, and you can really get into the, the nitty-gritty on the style used and the format, the formula uh, of that day that we, we see here. We're not going to get into a lot of that here, but just know that it's there and it's, it's kind of fascinating to dig into. The illustration is a painting that depicts Cicero, who was one of Rome's uh, greatest lawyer slash orators. They didn't really have attorneys the way we think of it, but really when you see what Tertullus does, uh, he's, he's much more of an orator and much less of a prosecutor. But here the scene is Cicero denouncing a senator to the Roman Senate for treason in 63 BC. A lot of, a lot, there's a lot going on there in, in the early days in Rome. And in the same manner, Tertullus now denounces Paul before Felix. We know very little about this guy, Tertullus. Uh, he has a Roman name, and so people assume he's a Roman citizen, but probably he had to be well-versed in Jewish law to try that case here, or maybe he wasn't, and he was just the highest-priced, you know, flashiest attorney available. We do see some of that going on today. Felix does not seem to like Jews at all, so it, it maybe is uh, telling that the prosecution picks a Roman uh, to uh, present their case. Luke doesn't record any words spoken by the high priest Ananias. Possibly uh, Ananias thought that his mere presence would uh, somehow influence the verdict. For whatever reason, he took a personal interest in seeing Paul put away. This was personal to him, that he would make the trek from Jerusalem, not, not just uh, leaving Jerusalem, but going to a pagan Roman town such as Caesarea. Normally, they wouldn't set their foot in, in such a place, but uh, that's, uh, that's Ananias for you. Five days would be a somewhat short time frame for both parties to organize their cases. They're moving quickly here. Um, law usually doesn't <laughs> uh, doesn't move that quickly and doesn't today either. But given the favor shown by Lysias, who was the Roman guard in the last chapter, perhaps they knew Felix would move to dismiss their case if the prosecution didn't move quickly enough. Verse 2, after Paul had been summoned, Tertullus began accusing him, saying to the governor, Since we have attained great peace through you, and since reforms are being carried out for this nation by your foresight, we acknowledge this in every way and everywhere, most excellent Felix, with all thankfulness. But that I may not weary you further, I beg you to grant us a brief hearing by your kindness." This is a statue of Quintilian who uh, lived in 30, between 35 and 100 AD, so exactly the same time we're, uh, we're in here with Paul. Uh, he was another influential Roman rhetorician, and he actually authored the textbook on rhetoric, uh, where he instructed orators of that day to include flattery in their speeches, just as we see Tertullus doing here before Felix. He also suggests brevity as a way to gain favor, and we don't have a whole lot recorded by this, this Tertullus, so maybe he's following uh, in, in this uh, Quintilian's footsteps here. Like I said, we can really geek out at all of the technical stuff, the legal stuff going on here, but in order that I will not be more tedious to you, we, we'll, uh, we'll move on. This is one of Felix's coins from the year 54, 
And in this case, Tertullus's flattery is so excessive, it actually contradicts the historical facts from what we know about Felix. He was the governor of Judea and Syria from 52 to 59, and we think this hearing is taking place in uh, 57 because he'll be in prison for two years, and we know that Felix will be deposed in 59. So by all accounts, Felix was not a, a glorious, glowing person, but he was actually more of a wretch who liked to terrorize his subjects. By the end of this chapter, uh, Luke will record that he's being replaced by Festus, but what Luke omits is that it's the reason because Felix was so brutal against the Jews. That's why Nero, of all people, ousted him in, uh, in AD 59. Tertullus continues, For we have found this man a public menace and one who stirs up dissensions among all the Jews throughout the world and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He even tried to desecrate the temple, so indeed we arrest him. So you have three charges that are being leveled right in this uh, in this passage here. Today, uh, you know, as it's the same, prosecutors often overreach intentionally in their charges. Either they're hoping, you know, some they, they throw a bunch up and they, they're hoping at least one thing will stick. But more likely, uh, the the more charges you can throw at someone, the the worse you make the defendant look in the eyes of the judge or in the eyes of the jury. It, it's it's almost like, you know, we, we know they're supposed to be presumed innocent, but, you know, the, the, jurist, the jurist thinks, well, they wouldn't be charging him with all of this if he wasn't a really bad person. So he's trying to paint Paul in the worst possible light. And this is where we get our adversarial legal system that we have today. It's, uh, that's what they're supposed to do. And the, uh, the defense, for, uh, for their part, is supposed to vigorously defend, um, even if the, if the attorney knows his client's guilty, you're supposed to vigorously defend. That's just, that's just the way it works. Uh, you present, uh, the prosecution presents in the worst light, and the defense presents in the best light. Public menace here, the Greek is more like a real plague. And it's uh, what we see from this uh, Tertullus is that he is more in this for emotional responses than for facts. Being a pest or a menace is not a good quality, but it's not a crime for which you can indict someone. Now let's go ahead and look at the individual accusations Tertullus is leveling here. So charge number one is stirring up dissensions. And this one would be the accusation that would have caused Felix to you know, sit up straight and, and take notice. The other two charges are sectarianism and sacrilege. Sectarianism might be a violation of Roman law if they wanted to enforce it. Sacrilege would definitely be, in this case, viewed as a, a Jewish internal matter. But um, stirring up dissensions or sedition or inciting a resurrection would be a violation of Roman law. And in most cases, it would be punishable by death. Remember the two laws that Rome had that were above everything else, pay your taxes and don't revolt. Romans did not tolerate failure to comply with either exception. So if Paul is actually uh, stirring up a revolt, then that, you know, that would be a serious charge. Charge number two, he's ringleader of a sect. And by his alleged crimes, what uh, Tertullus is saying here, that sect is outside of Rome's protection. In other words, it claims to be Jewish, uh, but it's not because Judaism, Judaism was protected by Rome's tolerance laws that allowed it to be exempt from worshiping Rome's pantheon of gods. But because this sect is not Jewish, in other words, they're practicing an illegal religion. So again, that, that might have been something that caused uh, Felix to you know take notice to, but you know he's, he's this is really just more of a Jewish matter. You see a picture here of the town of Nazareth that was taken in the early 1890s, and uh, so today it's it's one of the biggest cities in uh, in Israel. It's mostly Arab uh, populated, but uh, it's interesting to look at these pictures before the population uh, growth uh, happened. So the sect of the Nazarenes. Um, this may have been intended to malign Paul by associating him with. The small backwater village. Remember the quote from the Gospels, can anything good come from Nazareth? And so it, it, it could be a put down in that respect. It's interesting, when I was reading my commentaries, the Protestant commentators all saw this as a put down. The sect of Nazarene was a put down, but the Messianic commentators did not. 
Uh, and I be- I don't think that we necessarily need to view it as a put down. Even today, and this is what the Messianic uh, writers pointed out, the name of a famous rabbi, the nickname is the Lubavitcher Rabbi. And that's because he's from Lubavitchi, a town in Russia from which the founding rabbi held. We know that through the 5th century, believers in Jesus refer to themselves, Jewish believers, uh, refer to themselves as Notzrim, after the rabbi from Netzeret, which is how you would say Nazareth in Hebrew. Uh, Notzerim is actually the word for Christians in modern Hebrew. And so I think either way, we should proudly bear the name of Jesus the Nazarene. We don't necessarily need to see it as a put down. He may have meant it as a put down, but we don't need to, we don't need to take it that way. The Greek word for sect here, S-E-C-T, is where we get our term heresy, but that's not how the word was used in the first century. So some commentators pick up on this, and and they're being a a bit anachronistic here. Um, Its meaning is sect. The Pharisees were a sect. The Sadducees were a sect. The Nazarenes were a sect. In contrast to the first two groups, what Tertullus is saying is that this sect is outside Judaism and not protected by Rome. The charge of sectarianism here intends to portray Paul as a leader of some non-Jewish cult. But as we've seen several times here, and we'll see a few more times, Paul defends this charge almost more strongly than any other charge. He does so because the sect of the Nazarenes is a Jewish sect. It's the way, it's the right way. They're following the Jewish Messiah. And then charge number three here is sacrilege against the temple. Luke has already given us the background on this in prior chapters, and so we know the charge is false, but now you've got it officially on the record here. We've talked before about the signs that would have been posted along this uh, low wall that you see highlighted in uh, in um, orange here. And it was warning to uh, Gentiles not to pass that area, and, and you know, it would be punishable by death. And so... According to the law, for if Paul did this, uh, this would have been a grave charge. It may have been just the style of that day, but Tertullus here is very light on details, particularly regarding the sedition charge, uh, dissensions throughout all the world. He might have feared here Felix could have ordered a change of venue because if these activities took place, you know, somewhere in modern Greece or modern Turkey, then he could have moved the you know order that the uh, the hearing take place where these activities took place. Um, any judge in those regions though would have been far more unlikely to give any weight to charges brought by non citizen Jews than than here in uh, Caesarea. So Tertullus might think he has some leverage over Felix. He wants his case tried right here. Felix, what we know uh, that the prosecution doesn't know is Felix has listed his letter that all of these charges are unlikely to be true. So uh, (laughs) we know something that they don't. This next passage here is disputed, and it does not appear in translations such as the NASB, but it doesn't. Uh, it is included in King James and uh, New King James. So I'll include it here because I think it's interesting. And wanted to judge him according to our law, but the commander Lysias came by and with great violence took him out of our hands, commanding his accusers to come to you. Now, why this is interesting is because if this is omitted or included, it changes the scene's tone depending on which way we land. So let's read the next couple of verses that highlight the problem here. By interrogating him yourself concerning all these matters, you will be able to ascertain the things which we are accusing him. The Jews also joined in the attack asserting these things were so. We need to know who the him is that Tertullius is asking Felix to examine. Is it Paul or is it Lysias? So if we include the disputed verses there, uh, then it it reads, by interrogating Lysias yourself, you will be able to ascertain the things we are accusing Paul. That seems to make more sense here. And after researching it, I'm leaning towards maybe we should have these verses included. Uh, Maybe they are authentic. If you remove the verses, then what you're left with is, by interrogating Paul yourself, you will be able to ascertain the things that we are accusing him of. Now, that seems to expect Paul to self-incriminate, which uh, you know any defendant, much less someone of Paul's verbal skill, is highly unlikely to do. And of course, a judge does not need anyone's permission to, uh, to interrogate anyone. And so the invitation here is just another way of implying the correctness of his assertion. You know, see for yourself he, without actually uh, arguing the, uh, the, the assertions. 
So if the passage is omitted, this is from MacArthur, Tertullus would be would be asking Felix to examine Paul, but the Pauli, Paul merely would have denied Tertullius's accusation. If the passage is genuine, then he would be falsely accusing Lysias of overstepping his authority by meddling in a proper Jewish legal proceeding. He would then claim that an examination of Lysias is what is needed to confirm the Jewish leader's false interpretation of the event. So it's interesting the way you know this disputed passage actually changes the way we would need to read the uh, the this, this section here. And again, there's nothing to suggest that Tertullus knew of, or especially knew the contents of Lysias' letter to uh, to Felix. So his plan, if that's what it is, is, is about to backfire splendidly. Uh, he wants to blame Lysias. Uh, remember, Lysias told Felix that he gloriously and heroically came to the aid of a Roman citizen who was about to be unjustly attacked by a mob. That's Lysias' story anyway. So if, if this is what's happening, it explains Felix's decision to grant a continuance until Lysias can testify. Or you know, what happens is it gives Felix a necessary cover to stall, which is exactly what he does. As is supposed to be the case today, the burden of proof rests with the prosecutor and with the accuser. No doubt Luke probably edited down what would have been a lengthy argument by Tertullus, but um, you know the case of Paul being a dangerous insurrectionist you know, seems, uh, pardon the expression, it seems a bit trumped up here in this case. In any case, Tertullius rests here, and uh, you know uh, this whole speech is based more on emotion than fact, and it ends with everyone shouting, you know, this guy may have been a famed orator, but I think he was a bit lacking as a prosecutor. And when the governor had nodded for him to speak, Paul responded, knowing that for many years you have certainly made a judge, been a judge to this nation, I cheerfully make my defense, since you can take note of the fact that no more than 12 days ago, I went up to Jerusalem to worship. So Paul opens with not a glowing, you know, blowing smoke to Felix, but just simply a, a, an acknowledgement of Felix as the leader. And, and then he, he goes into his defense. So Felix doesn't have any particular affinity for either side. Often the judge would directly interrogate the accused, which of course is not allowed in our courts today, but is a common practice in the ancient world. So it's curious that Felix doesn't do that. He instead nods towards Paul and allows Paul to uh, to give his own defense. Paul's praise here is not flattery. He just he's simply reminding Felix that with his many years of knowledge of Jewish law, Felix has an obligation to give a just verdict, which of course Felix is not going to do in this case. It's more than 12 days since I went up to worship at Jerusalem. So what Paul is saying here is you can call witnesses who can testify of my whereabouts for the entire time. Uh, and, and I did not have time to incite a revolt. I was focused on worshiping at the temple. Neither in the temple did they find me carrying on a discussion with anyone or causing a riot, nor in the synagogues, nor in the city itself. So what we have here is verses 11 and 12 are stating the facts. Uh, this is uh, just factual. Anyone can can check these out. Now in verse 13, Paul's going to offer his opinion and conclusion. Nor can they, because of this, can they prove to you the things of which they now accuse me. According to the law of Moses, an accusation was not to be heard unless it could be established by multiple witnesses. And so witnesses who could be cross-examined and allow for the accusation to be verified or, or determine that it was false. So call, Paul was confident uh, that you know he knew that there were no accusations could be brought and that any any witnesses uh, would be false. That's why there are none here. So he's he's drawing drawing a, a connection here for Felix here. They have no proof of any crime, and, and if so, Paul says they should have presented it. The burden of proof rests with them, and they didn't meet that burden. So I I am innocent. I confess to you that in accordance with the way which they call a sect. I do serve the God of our fathers, meaning I'm a Jew, believing everything that is done in accordance with the law as and it is written in the prophets, having a hope in God in which these men cherish themselves. So I'm the same as them, that there certainly shall be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. So Paul appeals 
to his commitment to the written word of God, and it's a value that he shared with his accusers, and he tried to use this to vindicate himself. After stating facts and offering his opinion, he now uh, elects to reinforce a, a character, we might call it a character witness. He's saying, not only did I not do those things, I'm not the type of person who would ever do those things that they're accusing me of. He proudly admits to belonging to the sect of the Nazarenes and stresses that he is a faithful Jew while, while doing so, and that's important here. Paul uh, speaks to defend his Judaism, and more specifically, his we, we might say his Messianic Judaism here. The opposing, opposing party was probably Sadducees. They would have denied the prophets we talked about last time. Uh, they, they denied the resurrection. And so, ironically, it was the Sadducees and not Paul who were outside the, the mainstream of traditional Jewish theology. Most people, uh, most you know, normal, everyday people believed in the resurrection. So the part of this statement that is relevant to this trial is, again, the fact that Judaism is protected religion under Rome's toleration policy, and Paul is availing himself. He says, "We're, you know, I, I am under that because I am a Jew, and that's, that's important. This is a picture of the garden tomb in Jerusalem where some Protestants believe Jesus was buried and, and resurrected here. Paul is possibly referencing Daniel 12 in this uh, mention of resurrection. As many of those who slept in the dust of the ground will awake, these to everlasting life, but others to the disgrace and everlasting contempt. And those who have insight will shine like the glow of the expanse of heaven and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So uh, he's saying you, not only he's, he's giving a theology <laughs> lesson here, too. Uh, if you don't believe in the resurrection, um, you know, you're wrong. And uh, you, know, you might find yourself on the wrong side of the equation. Paul continues, in view of this, I also do my best to maintain a blameless conscience, both before God and before other people always. And there's a, a, a possible allusion here to Proverbs 3. Take thought for all for good deeds in the sight of the Lord and of uh, human beings. And then most of us know Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. So right before that is saying, you know, do good deeds in the sight of God and of, of our fellow humans. So blameless in this sense means he is committed to a life in accordance with the Torah, blameless uh, you know, before our people. Keener uh, calls this, quote, an implied argument from probability, which was a strongly favored line of argument in ancient law courts. So Paul is a Roman citizen and even a faithful Jew who even brings charity. He's not the kind of person who would be involved in the, these types of crimes. So verse 16 here is a great discipleship verse. We must demonstrate our righteousness on two realms, right? One before God and the other is before our neighbors. We can't neglect one at the expense of the other. Now, after several years, I came to bring charitable gifts to my nation and to present offerings in which they found me occupied in the temple, having been purified without any crowd or uproar. But there were some Jews from Asia who ought to have been present before you, meaning where are they? They're, where are my accusers? Um, and to have bring charges if they have anything against me. So the churches from whom Paul had collect money uh, showed their generosity in giving sacrificially. So far from instigating rebellion in the uh, in the Roman Empire, Paul's actually organizing acts of charity here. Um, he elsewhere refers to this giving of the churches as generous in 2 Corinthians. But this is the only reference in Acts to the delivery of the offering that he's been collecting. So it's, it's kind of this um, sub theme that runs through Paul's letters, but it's not really emphasized here in Acts. And we get the sense that Paul would rather not have mentioned it here, except that it demonstrates the, uh, the opposite of stirring up strife. Paul went to Jerusalem not to cause a riot, but he went on a human, humanitarian mission. He was in the um, process of uh, sanctifying himself and worshiping, and that's important, and we're going to get to that in, in a second. But he would have washed in a mikvah like this one. Uh, it was an important part of purification for every Jew. Again, he's saying that he's, uh, he's following the, the, the traditions and the statutes. If Jesus came to do away with the sacrificial system, though, it was news to Paul. And this is kind of one point we want to make here. They found me purified in the temple, and I was presenting offerings. So if Jesus came to do away with the offerings, it was news to Paul, because they continued to bring sacrifices as long as the temple was standing. In any case, Paul goes through the full course of Levitical purification, 
And he was in the process of doing so when his assailants came upon him. And so mentioning the fact that all this is happening in the temple might have been very relevant and very important to note in a Roman court because they viewed, you know, they're very uh, religious and we would say pagan, but, you know, the, under the uh, umbrella of religion, temples of any kind were to be sacred. They were places of refuge. And yet Paul was apprehended in the very process of worshiping. And that's a point we can't miss. Not only is Paul saying he's not guilty, he's implying that his accusers are guilty for profaning a sacred act of worship. They're the ones who started the riot, not me. I was minding my own business in the temple. So uh, he's trying to turn the tables here. Again, it's the folks from Asia who are making the accusation. They should have been here to make their case. So in a sense, Paul's also, also arguing that Tertullus did not have standing because he's only bringing a hearsay of count uh, 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 account of what the Jews from Asia said. So this is not this is not really admissible. Or else have these men themselves declare what violation they discovered when I stood before the council. So, you know, moving on from the folks from Asia, turning to the prosecution and saying, hey, what, what offense was charged before me when I stood before the council other than in regard to this one declaration which I shouted while standing among them for the resurrection of the dead, I am on trial before you today. So Paul's bringing back the resurrection here. So it's noteworthy that the original accusers have not shown up here. He challenges the prosecution to bring findings of guilt from the council in the previous chapter. There, there are none. They can't because there aren't any. Here's a picture of the edicule at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is the probable location of Jesus' resurrection. In any case, belief in the resurrection was not a crime. Paul was not responsible for the fact that Sadducees and Pharisees argued about uh, whether there was a resurrection. So, you know, there, there's nothing to charge me with, is what he's saying. So a summary of his defense here. First, he did not incite an insurrection as he was accused in verse 5a. He faithfully keeps this Torah. Second defense is being a notzerim, a follower of Jesus of Nazareth, is no grounds for the complaint in verse 5, uh, the last part of verse 5. The sect known as the Way is fully within Judaism, and it's protected by Rome's toleration laws, And which is interesting because uh, it's somewhat ironically, Messianic Jews are not protected today by the modern state of Israel. They're considered non-apostate, non-Jewish apostates. Next line, he did nothing wrong in the temple or elsewhere, which is addressing the accusation in verse 6a. Um, in fact, he brought gifts for believing and non-believing Jews to Jerusalem here. And then his closing argument, basically the accusers did not make their case. He challenges them to bring witnesses that will stand up uh, and further a Jewish delegation divided on whether there is a resurrection is not a condition to judge him uh, about whether Jesus is the Messiah. So uh, Paul's defense here is uh, pretty, pretty solid. Felix, having quite accurate knowledge about the way, a little nod by Luke there, adjourned the, uh, them saying, when Lysias, the commander, comes down, I will decide your case. And he gave orders to the centurion for Paul to be kept in custody and yet have some freedom not to prevent any of his friends from providing his need. So the prosecution has no case. Do not hire uh, Tertullus as your lawyer. I don't think they got their money's worth here. If Felix had an accurate knowledge about the way, then he knew that no disciple of Jesus would ever participate in sedition, agitation, insurrection, and he also knew that they were hated by the Sadducees who stood before him. So on the surface, this seems like it should have been good news for Paul. Felix had no interest in turning Paul over to Ananias, and based on Lysias' letter, uh, Felix knew what Lysias was going to testify to. It's the old legal adage, don't ask a question unless you already know the answer. And it, it appears here Lysias is, is a favorably disposed towards Paul and would have delivered a good report. So uh, what's more, Paul, of course, has dirt on Lysias regarding the matter of uh, binding and striking a Roman citizen without charge. However, um, there is no indication that Felix ever intended to summon Lysias to Caesarea. So we'll never know what happened. Felix is corrupt, and so he, he was probably just stalling here for political reasons. In addition to providing Paul with fellowship, contact, uh, you know, he, he would have brought, been allowed to have things like clothes, uh, some of the things you see in this uh, mosaic here. Felix could have rendered a not guilty verdict, but he was afraid that that would probably lead to further trouble. And the number one rule was to maintain order. And sometimes that meant justice had to take a back seat. 
Um, so he stalls the pre the the proceedings under the pretense of needing further information from Melissius, but we read later that he wants to gain personally from this somehow. And is it any wonder why the Old Testament devotes so much space uh, and to the importance of a nation having just judges? Because when we lose justice, everything just goes off the rails quickly, and that's what we see here. Uh, so this is leaving Paul in legal limbo. He, he doesn't have any charges against him. He can't be formally arrested. Yet the outcome of the hearing still pending, he's not free to go either. And uh, so he's, we might call this, he's in open arrest. As a Roman citizen, he would have been well treated, but uh, he's, he wasn't free to, to go about his day. Scholars believe that it's the governor's res residence in Caesarea, which you see on the screen here, the old uh, promontory palace of Herod the Great would have been where Paul was kept. The prison was likely located at the eastern end of the uh, the palace complex, and you can see a, a uh, caption on, on the screen there showing to the po possible location. It's curious, I was there not too long ago, and excavations are continuing, and they found a basement level underneath the uh, this line here, and uh, possibly that's where Paul was in prison there. So it's a fascinating place. Uh, Archaeology is really <laughs> uh, advancing and, and catching up. Now, some days later, Felix arrived with Drusilla, his wife, who was Jewish, and he sent for Paul and heard him speaking about faith in Christ Jesus. But he was discussing, as he was discussing righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix became frightened and responded, go away for now. When I have an opportunity, I will summon you. So Drusilla here is Felix's third wife. She was likely not even 20 years old, and some sources say she was only 16. Felix lured her away from her then husband, you know, violating all, all kinds of commandments there. Um, she's the daughter of Agrippa I, so this is all, you know, family, <laughs> big family drama here. She's Jewish, yes, but she's also a Herod, which means morals were a little lacking. Nonetheless, as a Jew, she probably prayed at the temple, like you see in this picture here today. It says that there's a women's section where um, of, of the Western Wall where the women gather to pray. Paul realized this was not an on-the-record legal discussion, and apparently, uh, well, in quotes, everyone knew, uh, unquote, that when an official wanted to see a prisoner privately, you know, the official was really asking, hey, what's, what's it worth to you if I make this go away? Um, there's truly nothing new under the sun here. Instead, Paul's not going to give a bribe, and instead he takes the opportunity to challenge Felix on his low morality with the hope of showing him forgiveness through Jesus. But um, Paul's directness here probably was was a little off-putting to Felix, and it's reminiscent of the Old Testament prophets. They were very much less cordial uh, and, and, you know, uh, offensive in some respects to the upper class leader they were speaking to. This is a uh, passage regarding Elijah the prophet and talking to King Ahab of, of the, uh, the northern uh, country of Israel. When Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is it you, you troubler of Israel? And Elijah answered, remember, this is the king. You're supposed to give the king respect and deference, but Elijah does not hear. I have not troubled Israel, but you have, and your father's house, because you have abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. And that leads into the whole showdown in 1 Kings 18, a fantastic story between Elijah and the, the prophets of Baal. But it shows Paul is following in those footsteps here. He's not giving any respect where he doesn't see any as due. Felix was not a picture of righteousness or self-control, so he tries to run. Uh, he was frightened enough about the prospect of judgment to run away, but not frightened enough to believe the gospel. That's a very sad and dangerous place to be in. Historians record that after Felix was ousted by Nero, he kept on running. He ran to an upscale place in Italy called Pompeii. And it's rather ironic that he fled Paul's fire and brimstone teaching on the final judgment and ran right into literal fire and brimstone when Mount Vesuvius erupted in, uh, seven, in the year 79, burying Pompeii. And that included Drusilla and her daughter in ash. So they ran right into the fire there. At the same time, he was also hoping that some money would be given to him by Paul, again, make this go away. Therefore, he used to send for him, and they, was to, they would talk often with him. But after two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Porcius Festus, and Felix, wanting to do the Jews a favor, left Paul in prison. Roman law officially prohibited taking bribes, but nonetheless, they were very commonplace here. We know Lysias was never called. Paul was kept in custody, even though uh, Felix had pretty much decided that he was innocent. 
But there was no reason to release him unless he could get something out of it. So he wanted some, uh, some, a little something for his trouble here. The Turks and the Persians in the Middle Ages had this concept called bakshish. And it's generally consistent with our concept of tipping or, or gratitude, gratuity, paid that you give to someone to do some service for you. But with the exception, the person in that culture wouldn't do the so-called charitable deed unless they knew what was in it for them in advance. And oftentimes the, the price would go up. You know, I'm sorry, <laughs> you've given me 20, but now the price is 40. And then, you know, we'd, we'd get into those kind of discussion. Felix would be gladly more than happy to let Paul uh, out of his generosity go, no strings attached, except that he wanted this bakshish first. So yeah, it's, it's pretty much a bribe. We know Felix was brutal in putting down uprisings, and so he probably wanted to use Paul as some kind of peace offering. We aren't aren't sure why. Uh, He had no love for the Jews. In reality, we know that the delay is all due to God's timing in orchestrating Paul's trip to Rome. This part's interesting. Uh, Verse 27 says, the NASB, and the NASB says, Paul was left only in prison, yet some other versions have bonds. Um, There's some debate about whether he would have been shackled or not. You weren't supposed to bind a Roman citizen without charge, and there's still been no charge made. And probably given the liberties that Paul had back in verse 23, this does appear to be more of a house arrest type of arrangement. Festus succeeded Felix around 59, and he was proconsul until he died in the year 62. Um, In in that day, it's not like uh, Felix left a three-ring binder of notes and allowed his successor to get up to speed with the trial. When the convening authority vacated the bench, as in this case, it was pretty much the equivalent of a mistrial. And now uh, Festus is going to have to start everything all over again and get up to speed and um, you know, kind of retry the case again. So that we will get into next time. Chapter 25, we'll see Paul's defense before Festus as his testimony before governors and kings continues. We'll see that next time on the Talmudim Way.